interesting th thing about this concept of the OGP is that <clears throat> it gives, gives us the opportunity of the representatives from governments, NGOs, organizations, and also multilateral organizations can actually meet in the same room. And we can have the discussion and exchange our views and experiences. So it's very appropriate, I think, that as the next speaker to start us off, I've invited Helen Derbyshire from uh, Access Info Europe. So Helen, what do you think would be main issues and what are your experiences and things you want, want to challenge us? Thank you very much indeed, John. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the most important questions I heard yesterday asked by Beth Novak was what gets you out of bed in the morning? <laughs> um, I, I, the, I, my, we were having a little debate about this on Twitter um, and uh, I said that it was uh, using the right of access to information as an instrumental right to defend human rights, promote democracy. Um, I don't know what your reasons are. Maybe it's the nice picture of the cup of coffee we saw there. That was very tempting. Um, but it's fantastic that so many of you did get out of bed in the morning to be here to discuss especially on this uh, sort of slightly misty November morning as it is now, um, which is a holiday in many countries in this region as well. That was a great commitment, I think, for many people to come on what was a national holiday. Um, what I want to do is just very briefly to kick the debate off, is talk a little, or, or get us thinking a little bit about the specificities of the European region. What are the kind of things that we might want to take into consideration as the European regional group, which are different from other regions? There's a, a huge amount we have in common, um, including in our engagement in this open government partnership process for both governments and civil society. I think it was a huge scramble at the beginning when the whole thing got launched and up and running to get the action plans together, to figure out what it was all about, to figure out how to get engaged from the civil society perspective, also to get the money to get to Brasilia last year or to, to London now, which some groups haven't been able to do, in fact. Um, so there are lots of things we have in common with our colleagues from all around the world. We have adopted action plans um, with less than perfect cons consultation me me mechanisms which don't always contain uh, commitments which are strictly speaking open government, um, too much e-government perhaps, not enough open government. So to that we've got all in common. What's, what's different about Europe? I think one thing is that this region has a particularly long tradition of open government. We have the world's first access to information law from 1766. And we've got countries which have been trying to do openness and participation for a very long time. We also have countries in the region, however. We have the, the new democracies that Rada, you referred to, which are still relatively young democracies. But we also have um, countries which are... Uh, which, are, which are still trying to f find their, their place. The country that I live and work in, Spain, still does not have an access to information law. So we go from countries which have the oldest ones to countries with no legal mechanisms for transparency yet. In, it's, in the, it's in the pipeline. But um, we ha are, It's a very developed region, uh, economically developed region, which I think gives huge possibilities uh, in terms of um, in terms of making full use of the promises offered by new technologies, having the resources to carry out participatory processes. At the same time, it's a region which is being rocked very badly by the financial crisis. And that financial crisis is putting a strain not only on the ability of governments to dedicate money to doing open government, to opening up, new, to, to investing, for example, in cleaning up data sets for release, or in investing in complex consultation mechanisms in restructuring, although that's perhaps, it's also the time, the crisis is the time to address some of these issues. Um, it's, it's also a crisis which is putting a strain on and creating a threat in some ways to our democratic 
um, values. We, we talk a lot in Europe about the democratic deficit. We've seen the um, very rushed decision making related to the crisis, which has kind of bypassed our traditional decision making mechanisms, sometimes taking decisions outside the normal checks and balances which parliaments um, I suppose the role that parliaments are supposed to play out of the, the need to take rapid decisions to try to address the crisis. We've seen in the context of the crisis increasing racism and xenophobia um, and a fear with the European Parliament elections next year that we're going to have more uh, political parties elected which are really not that in favour of open government. And that's an important consideration. How do we address that? Are we doing it right? Are we bringing the populations along with us? Would they also, would everyone else be ready to get out of bed at eight o'clock on a, a rainy Friday morning in London to talk about open government? Do people care? Or are people disillusioned, disenchanted, frustrated? And I think one of the challenges that's very specific to this region is the complexity of the decision-making processes. I know that we're talking about a region which is wider than the European Union, um, nevertheless, the existence of Brussels, of the EU, with the decisions that go through it, affects not only the 28, but it has a wider impact on our laws and policies. Um, my organization, Access Info Europe, just won a case against the Council of the European Union to get access to a document. What did we want to know? We simply wanted to know which countries were putting forward amendments to amend the EU's transparency rules because we wanted, to know, we wanted to be able to engage in that process. It was a five-year legal battle which ended on the 17th of October at the European Court of Justice, saying that we had a right of access to that document. And the judgment from the court is beautiful because it talks about the link between transparency, participation, and accountability. The point I'm making with giving that example of that court case is that it's not something we've yet secured totally clearly yet in Europe. We still have a lot of work to do. We have um, coming out of the EU and all the laws which are adopted from the EU, which, as I say, help influence the legal framework, not only at the national level, but more widely, we have particular legislative, um, particular pieces of legislation which nowhere else in the world has. I won't go into details and bore you with it, but we have something called the Directive on the Reuse of Public Sector Information, which is comp confusing the picture for many public officials and encouraging charging. Just at the time when under open government we're talking about open data and dropping charges on information, we have an EU directive which makes it look like perhaps we could or should be charging for access and which encourages government officials to ask why do you want the information, which is something which is in direct conflict with our laws on the right of access to information, our freedom of information laws. We have issues of privacy. We, I mean, somebody Yesterday, by the end of the day, finally someone mentioned the elephant in the room, which was the, is the surveillance issue, and it was great that they did that. Um, it, it is a bit of an elephant, I would say. Um, we have a, a region, Europe, which is shocked by the revelations that, uh, from the Snowden disclosures about spying and surveillance, and yet at the same time, there is a European Union directive on data retention which has been struck down by constitutional courts in some countries, in Germany, and now the EU is, has an infringement procedure against Germany um, for not implementing EU law. So we've got some very important tensions, and the issue of privacy, the issue of data retention, um, is definitely uh, an issue which, as when we're talking about open government, um, we have to take into consideration as well. So there, that, that, there are just a few of the challenges. I should also mention the other regional body, the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe with its very significant body of human rights rules. The European Court of Human Rights, which in 2009 and then again this June ruled that the right of access to information, so transparency as a right, as a right linked to freedom of expression and enshrined in the European Human Rights Convention. That's very important. So what we're doing here with the Open Government Partnership, we're not only looking at transparency, accountability and participation as something voluntary, we're actually implementing rights which the international human rights tribunals are now recognizing as the fundamental rights 
of European citizens. That's an important consideration, and it's where Europe is and could continue to take a lead, not just for this region, but globally. Um, and so, to, so those, are, those are some thoughts that I think we can discuss. I think that's, overall, it's a very positive picture, and there's a lot of opportunity and there's a lot to build on. I've got up on the screen um, a website that we've developed, Open Government Standards. We've been working to define more specifically from the civil society perspective, more specifically, what is open government? What do we mean by open government? And I like the picture that we've got from our video, which is of, I guess she's a doctor probably, a um, little red cross of a hospital. What, what, why is government important? It's not only, why is open government important? It's not only about releasing data for business, although I agree, particularly in the context of the crisis, that's important, but it's also about ensuring that the health systems, which Europe should be very proud of as a world leader in having um, public health systems, how do we defend those in times of crisis? And really to finish, because um, I know we want to open up the debate, I, I strongly support from the civil society perspective, and we discussed this in some civil society fora yesterday, strongly support having more networking regional meetings. We, it was very useful to have the meeting that the Croatian government hosted in Dubrovnik to bring together the European countries. I see nodding, that's great. Um, we also had a meeting in Rome in December of last year, which was a smaller meeting but equally useful, and thanks to the Italian government for pulling that together. So yes, let's have some regional discussions so that we can, in a focused way, address some of these very specific issues and also find out in a contribution to the bigger open government partnership how to exploit and make the most of all the very strong tradition that Europe has of transparency, accountability and participation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you.